Is Jill going to get stuck in talking about the end of the world again? That's what we're going to find out in Mark 14. So we had a big lesson the last time about the end of the temple and the end of the world. That was a lot. Today we're going to keep going because we are coming again towards the very end of Mark. We have three more chapters left before we're done with Mark and we go into Luke. So right now we're coming up on the Passover day or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests, those are going to again be the Sanhedrin, the scribes, those are the studiers. They're sitting there thinking, how can we arrest this guy and kill him? Because we don't want people to get upset. The whole bunch of people are inside of Jerusalem now to celebrate Passover. Some of them believe that he is a prophet and John the Baptist was a prophet. We're just going to get everybody upset. And I'll say right here, there are too many Marys in the New Testament. And there are two stories of two different perfumes being poured on Jesus. So we're going to cover them both. Matthew and Mark give no name. Luke has one story of a different woman, and John has another story. It's not surprising, I guess, that more than one woman would do this. I believe in this case, this is going to be Mary, sister of Martha, and they are at Simon the leper's house. We're going to see another Simon in Luke, I think. But Simon the leopard was someone that Jesus healed. And they were reclining at the table because that's how we sat at our table. And the woman came over with the expensive perfume called nard, which came from India, and broke the flask, which was alabaster, also really expensive, and poured it over his head, anointing him, which means that we're preparing him for his death. People got anointed when you were praying for their health. People got anointed when they were going to become king, but you also anointed people in their death as part of the death ritual. So everyone's like, wait a minute, it's a lot of money. You know, we could have done a lot of great things with this money. And it doesn't say who was scolding her or who was saying this. We find out later it was, of course, Judas. But Jesus says, leave her alone. Don't bug her. She has done a great thing for me. You will not always have me. I am about to head out. And what she has done is anointing me before my burial. And when anyone tells the gospel, we're always going to talk about her. And you know what? We do. We still talk about her to this day. Half the time we're talking about what a great thing she did. And the other half of the time we're going, wait, which Mary was this again? But we're going to talk about her for sure. Apostles are very, I guess, formal in a way, rigid in a way. They're asking questions, rabbi. And I guess that was standard for how a rabbi was treated by their learners, the people who followed them around. But so many times we have seen people like the Phoenician woman who was begging for her child, Bartimaeus, who was begging for his eyesight, the centurion who was hoping that this child would be healed. These places where people didn't think, they didn't plan their reaction, they didn't mutter to themselves. They just came to Jesus with their heart and their tears just right out there for him to see. They broke down and begged Jesus for something. And in this case, too, she knew what she needed to do. Her heart told her what she had to do. This was an expensive thing given over poor men who Jesus said, we didn't have a home, we don't have a pillow, we don't have a place to sleep at night. Yet, Jesus sees this as faith. And Mark reports it as faith. These people who... Mark were speaking to, the Roman people who he was telling the story to, would see that this isn't some formal thing that you do, because there was, you know, rituals inside the Roman religion too. This is me coming before my God and breaking down, weeping, and doing the thing that's in my heart the most, like the other stories that Mark told. She did the one thing she had to do, and Jesus said, don't punish her for this. She's doing this from her heart. So what happens right after that? Judas betrays Jesus. This is going to be Judas Iscariot. It says he's one of the 12. We know he's one of the apostles, went to the chief priest and betrayed him. And boy, the chief priest, because they're look, they're plotting. They're how can we get rid of this guy? What can we do to get rid of him? And they were happy. They gave him money and then looked for that opportunity to betray him. And so people feel like this is giving an idea. I said in Matthew, why did Judas do this? 
Was he disappointed in Jesus? Was he trying to push a confrontation between everyone and Jesus? This makes it seem like a couple of things that we're going to find out that Judas was a greedy person and that maybe pushed him over the edge was this very wealthy thing that they could have taken that money and done some amazing things. They could have built their own temple with that kind of money. They could have done so many things and Jesus just wasted it. Or is it that Jesus is committed to his own death? He talked about his burial. What good is a dead Messiah? What good is a dead rabbi? This guy is supposed to lead us to get rid of these rotten Romans and get them out of our country. And if he's just insistent on dying, he's no good to any of us. So people feel that this is Mark's hint that this was a combination of that greed of the money and this despair over he's not even going to do the thing we hope he does. He's just had it. He has washed his hands of this whole thing. If I'm not going to get out of it what I want out of this, it's not even worth it anymore. This guy just wants to die. Let's just let him die. I, I mean, again, we don't know. But I think Mark, putting these two chapters right after each other, is giving us that hint that this is why it happened. So we'll hear in the other Gospels more information from their point of view of what happened. So Jesus then is going to have Passover with his disciples. We talked about this in Matthew. I think Passover would have been fairly well known as a holiday of the Jewish people among the Romans that were talking to them. So they would get this is a festival and that he says that this is a sacrifice of the Passover lamb. They may not have known the whole history of Exodus and the whole story of how Jesus is acting as the new Messiah, not to lead his people away from the Romans, but instead to lead his people away from sin. So he tells him, he says, go in the city and you'll see a man carrying a jar and he'll meet you, you know, so go follow him wherever he goes and say to the person who owns the house, my teacher has asked about the guest room so that we can have Passover dinner together. And he showed a large upper room that they prepared for us. Another bit of story from tradition, which doesn't mean that we necessarily know it's true, is that young man carrying a jar of water was supposedly Mark himself. Again. He is putting himself into the story so that we know he was there. He's not just some random translator who is talking to Peter, probably, and maybe other disciples, which is kind of interesting. Again, we'll find out, won't we? This large upper room, I got to see when I was in Jerusalem. Big. It's a a nice big room. It's It's a good room. And you can go see it. You can look it up on the internet and see pictures of it, too. So all that happened, and then he came with the 12, and they're reclining, because that's how you eat your meal, particularly Passover. You recline because you are free people, and free people get to recline at the table. And he says, you know what? One of you is going to betray me, one who is eating with me, one of you who dips your bread into the dish with me, because it's written, woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man had he not been born. So we know now that there's no good intention in this. And so some people are like, wait, is it, is it me? It's not me, right? Because now they wonder, like, you know, maybe they had some thoughts like, mm, I'm going to leave this. This is just for the birds. Or they had their own moments where they distrusted Jesus. And now they're worried, is, am I going to be the one who's going to do it? But it says the one who dips the bread. And so we see who that is and then adds a warning because Judas would have been better had he not been born. This week I was listening to a different podcast and he was saying at any time Judas could have done something else. He could have asked for help. He could have prayed to God. He could have asked Jesus for help. He could have brought aside any of the apostles and said, look, I'm having doubts. I'm going to do something terrible and I want to talk to you about it. He never did. He just did his thing. There was another sermon that was kind of interesting that said, if you're about to drive off the cliff away from God, Satan will find a way to put a car right in your path. Judas was planning on driving his car right off the cliff, and Satan found him a really easy way to do it. The chief priest wanted him dead, and he was brought right to them in this car, metaphysically, 
handed Jesus over to them and told them how to find him. Then he institutes the Lord's Supper. It's one we always talk about. Of course, we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus on Easter. But you know what? We celebrate it every time we take communion too, that Jesus instituted it. He asked us to do it as often as we think of him and that he means us to strengthen us, to to be a part of our worship of Jesus. And again, in heaven, we're going to go and drink that fourth cup together. And what's interesting, again, is that also means that we are going to be in the body in heaven as well. And someone said, go, don't drink wine. One of the commentaries said, our old wineskin is going to burst and we are going to get new wineskins, our new body, and drink together in heaven. And in talking about establishing his new covenant, a covenant means an agreement. This is what God says he is going to do for us. And we've seen many covenants in the Bible if we read the Old Testament. And we will talk about them as we go through the Old Testament when we get there. But this covenant is going to be not established instead. All the covenants are about the same message. And this time, Jesus is going to say that we're going to be clean. We're going to be forgiven. That it says, passages from Jeremiah where it says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's Jeremiah 31 that this covenant is now going to be about being his people and having our sins forgiven. So then Jesus talks to Peter after they were done singing hymns. They went out to the Mount of Olives, again, across this deep valley. And Jesus says that you're all going to fall away. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Jesus is going to die and they're going to run like the scared sheep that they are that he's going to be raised up and I will go before you to Galilee. And so Peter's like, I'm not going to fall away. Not happening. You know, because I think too, we get bold when we think and see things, right? It's easy for us to say, well, if I was in World War II, this is what I would do. Or if I was in that position, that's what I would do. It's a whole other thing when it happens to you and your very life is on the line. It's easy to say before that's happened. And Jesus is like, nope. I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter says it. If I have to die with you, I'm not going to deny you. I I will die with you. And they all said it. They all said that very thing. Jesus knows what's going to happen. And boy, you know, they sound all bold right now. So then they go and pray in Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a garden that is on the mountain of Olives. And he says to his disciples, he took Peter, James, and John. Those are the three he took, you know, to see the transfiguration too. You'd think that would make them, I don't know, more bold than they were. But he says, hey, sit here while I pray. Because he's sorrowful unto death. Remain here and watch. Remember, we just got this whole thing about the end of the world and you should watch and don't fall asleep. And instead, he was praying. He first asked God to remove this cup from him, meaning I don't want it to happen. Jesus is very human in this moment. He is going to suffer great pain. And even though he's God and he knows it has to happen and he knows it's going to happen, boy, doesn't it feel hard to not be afraid of something this horrible? But then he says, yet, not what I will, but what you will. So he comes and he finds them and says, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you just watch for one hour? He says, watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. He's not even asking them to watch and pray for him. He's asking them to watch and pray for them. But the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Boy, we all have high hopes of what we're going to do when tough times come and the flesh betrays us. You know, we can't fulfill the very things we say. So then he saw that they were sleeping again. So then he went away to pray some more in the same way he prayed before. And then he came back and they were sleepy and their eyes were heavy and they didn't know what to say. They were tired. And so he came a third time to them and said, are you still sleeping? All right. Taking your rest, it is enough. This is finished. And he says, the hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Let's go see what's going to happen now. So this is the end. 
He knows the time is over. He told them to stay up and to stay praying so that they could be strong against what's going to happen next, and they didn't. Instead, they slept. One of the commentaries were saying that, you know, their loyalty to their own strength was faulty. They said, I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to follow you all the way to the grave, and they couldn't do it. They didn't know what was going to happen, and they didn't know how scared they were going to be. Their faith should be in God and in Jesus, and instead they put their faith in their own strength to live up to the challenges that God gave them to do. Immediately, there we go with our immediately again, we're actioning. While he was speaking, Judas came, still one of the 12, and there was a crowd, a different crowd of swords and clubs and the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. So they brought the whole lot out there. The betrayer gave him the sign, which was going to be the kiss. And he says, the guy I'm going to kiss, go grab that. That's going to be the rabbi. And he comes up to him and he says, rabbi, and kissed him. When you say rabbi, it's not just saying, hey, teacher. You're saying, my teacher. I'm a part of you. So him saying rabbi is as much a betrayal as the kiss. So then they seized him. Then one of them, we find out in John that that was Peter, drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said, did you come out here to grab a robber with your swords and your clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was in the temple with you teaching and you didn't seize me there. You didn't take me. But this is to do the scriptures fulfilling. We find out that the man that Peter struck was healed, saving Peter from a life of being on the run. The shepherd was struck and the sheep fled right there and then. Boy, so much for being bold and we're going to die with you to the end. Did not happen. And the other part of them just taking him. I mean, this is just a guy, right? He doesn't have an army. He doesn't have a militia. He isn't the group of the Essenes who might have been armed or the groups of people who were trying uprisings. It's just a guy. Uh, peasants, fishermen, farmers. And so they come with clubs and swords. I mean, they could have just said, hey, come with us. And he would have come. Then it says a young man who followed him had a linen cloth about his body. And they tried to grab him and they grabbed his clothes, but the clothes stayed and the man ran off. And from the very beginnings of traditions in the Christian church, this is mentioned to also be Mark. Again, Mark putting him in the story in a very innocuous way. It's kind of weird, right? It's kind of a weird little bit in the story because we arrest Jesus, the apostle betrayed him, the other apostles ran, and then we have this little story about a guy standing there and had his cloak removed. I think it makes sense that Mark was putting himself in the story to say, I was there, I saw Jesus arrested. So they hauled Jesus before the council This is the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, the scribes, the people who went and arrested him. And Peter's kind of following in the distance, just pretending like, I'm just here watching. So he's in this courtyard of the high priest. And it says he's warming himself by the fire. You know, I think he's trying to keep his eyeballs on Jesus to see what's going to happen next. Is there a chance I could steal the rabbi away from these people? And so they're trying to figure out a way of putting Jesus to death. And they're coming up with all these like, well, could we put him to death for this? Or could we put him to death for that? And they had people who bore false witnesses against Jesus, meaning they were lying. And what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to have a normal trial. You're supposed to have one advocate that argues for the prosecution of the person and then one who argues for the defendant. People are brought up on both sides to testify this is not a true trial. This is a secret trial with no advocates, only on the side of prosecution. And they're bringing, again, false witnesses up. They're trying to get him on anything. And then this one guy says, well, I heard him say he's going to tear down the temple, which we all know he is talking about his body is going to be torn down, not the temple itself. We know this is a lie. And they know, we find out later, they know it's a lie. They know what he meant when he's saying, you strike me down, I'll come back. But they said, oh, okay, well, that sounds actually pretty good because he's saying that he's going to destroy the temple and that's going to cause havoc and riots. We got him. This is the thing that we're going to get him on. And so then they asked Jesus, don't you have anything to say to this? Jesus doesn't say where he remains silent. 
And so then he asks, are you the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus says, I am. There we go. I am again. You will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power, God the Father, and coming with the clouds of heaven the second time around. Well, now they got this whole other thing. So the chief priest tore his garment, right? Very dramatic. We don't have to say anything more. This man blasphemes. So they all condemned him and they began to spit on him and they covered his face and someone smacked him and said, prophesy, who was it who just hit you? Right? Jerks. The Sanhedrin had their own guards. The guards took him. That was the end of this fake trial. The Romans aren't going to care about blasphemy. They're going to like, what deal is this of ours? We don't care. We just want you to keep the peace and not fight things. Then Peter, like I said, he's hanging out there in this area, looking at the fire. And the servant girl, the high priest, so she's connected to the high priest, comes and says, hey, are you with him? Weren't you also with the Nazarene, Jesus, the guy from Nazareth? And he says, no, I, I don't know what you mean. So then he went out of the gateway. And the rooster crows, there's one time. What's funny about it is someone said that he was standing there warming himself in the light, and now he's moving away from the light, metaphorically deep. And the servant girl saw him over there on the other side and said, hey, this man's one of them. He denied it, but he is one of them. Certainly you're one of the Galileans. And he started, it says, invoking a curse on himself and swearing. And I don't know the man you speak of. And then the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered, oh, yeah, you're going to deny three times. And he broke down and wept. So he knew he had done the very thing he just said he wouldn't. And it's funny that a little girl would be the one to bring him to this horrible place. Wasn't even like a scary soldier or something like that. And that ends Mark 14. So we're coming close to the end. Again, the Romans, I think, would have been impressed with all of this. I think they would have been impressed how he stood there and took it, how he didn't grovel and he didn't cry. And he stood there and everything that was going to happen is going to happen. And this is what Mark is setting up. He's going to be the person who comes in glory with God. He is not just some rabbi debating points. He is the son of man, not just some child of a Caesar, because they all were like one worse than the other. But instead, he is the God who is going to come and judge. My meditation for this week is how many times, I guess, we deny Jesus in our own ways, where we see something where we clearly have to make a stand. And in the idea of getting along, we deny what it is we believe because we're trying to make peace with something. I'm not trying talking about like insulting someone or being mean to people. But could we be a stronger witness to Jesus and stand for what we believe? My prayer is that we always find those moments to talk to God when we feel like we're betraying him or we're scattering away from him, that we remove these events from us by asking him for genuine help, that we ask him to keep us from betraying. Judas at any time could have gotten out of this. But instead, he did the wrong thing without ever once asking God for help. And what I want to share with other people is that fact that Jesus doesn't call us to keep these things inside. He tells us to come to him and pray. He doesn't want us to betray. He doesn't want us to fall asleep. He doesn't want us to avoid the work we were supposed to do. He doesn't want us to deny him or be scattered like sheep. But instead, we should come to him with prayer and face whatever it is that we're supposed to face together with God. This is God. He is a man of action, and he is coming again in glory, the true God of action and the true God of forgiveness and prayer. I think the Romans would have been very impressed with it. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Please remember that you can find any of my other podcasts on a better life in small steps.com. Thank you so much for listening.